Good morning and welcome to the 2021 Dynamics tutorial for the Society of Vacuum Coders. I'm Larry Scipioni. If you look at this slide, you'll see images of a Dutch physicist, a spool of metal tape, and a uh, compact nuclear fusion reactor. And so the uh, what we're going to be talking about today is how all three of these things are connected. And, 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 and of course, uh, this is going to be as a topic of our title of the talk is thin film superconductors. So just to give some perspective, uh, I like to think about the difference between science and technology. Science is about discovery, about the unknown, about taking risks, where uh, technology is really about controlling variability, um, uh, having a, having a uh, elimination of variability and a high degree of control. So I think about the, uh, the semiconductor industry, the science you see on the left is the first uh, transistor, which was uh, built in 1947. When you think about technology, think about the semiconductor industry of today, it's probably one of the uh, paramount example of, of technological control that um, humankind has, has ever uh, achieved. Um, uh, according to SEMI, there was approximately 12.7 million square inches of silicon printed with thin film semiconductor de devices in 2018. And it's estimated there have been about 10 to the 20th transistors printed in the, in the history of the semiconductor age. It's an, in, an, in, an incredible accomplishment of technology. So we think about the same uh, uh, um, concept in superconductors, um, I want to give some perspective of where the, the field started with the discovery of superconductivity by Kamerling Ones in 1911. You can see this image on the left of the um, of his plot, the resistance of mercury dropping to zero. And uh, on the right, a highly engineered film stack of uh, that's used to now to create a high temperature super superconducting lines. Uh, and really, if you look at the, at the history of this technology, the first 50 years was trying to understand it and the last 50 or 60 years trying to harness it. Um, uh, it really is a field that which is ripe with uh, technological, with scientific dis discoveries. Uh, I have this quote from Bob Mumgard, who's the CEO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems, and he says, of the 100,000 plus known superconductors, only four have been commercialized. Although I would say today that's, that's six. The applications, though, have really been, have, have really been few. And, uh, and I would say that uh, uh, if we look at the different uh, forms that might be relevant to this society, I would say only one of them is really relevant and would could hold our interest, and that's REBCO HTS. So REBCO stands for rare earth barium copper oxide, which is the compound uh, that these are uh, materials are made of, and HTS is high temperature superconductors. And um, REBCO is going to be the final landing point of this of this talk. So I think the question is, why does this matter to the SVC? Um, HTS is not at the level of technological mat maturity that semiconductors now in, in, in enjoy. Uh, but I think it is at a level where it could be very interesting to the SVC. I pulled this little um, uh, clipping from the SVC website from last year, which was an advertisement for the 2020 TechCon. And uh, interestingly enough, it says at the bottom where I highlighted uh, a focus of the SVC is transitioning research and development results into production. And I was really motivated to give this talk, to give the challenge to this group of people of what could be done with HTS. So let's, let's wind back a uh, hundred years or so and uh, have a look at the discovery of superconductivity. This is Kamerling Onus's messy notebook. Uh, the original intent of him using mercury was as a high purity lead. He was actually measuring the electrical properties of other ma materials. So it was actually was a accidental discovery of superconductivity. Um, he also measured in his lab, the specific heat of helium, 
this dielectric constant and unknowingly he also observed super superfluidity and that was all on the same day a uh, very productive day for dr o onis and uh, he was even involved in helping veterans and orphans after world war ii so a a great guy and i would say he's my new superhero now uh, so let's look at what's uh, uh, something that, that's more ger germane to us. One was the first work in thin film superconductivity done. Uh, in my research, I found this paper by H. London in uh, 1935, and he states pretty clearly that the first investigation of thin films of superconductors, as they called them back then, was done by Saizu and Onus. So Onus, again, was involved in the first thin film work on superconductors. I'll have a, have a look at this right here on this next slide. Um, in 1925, he um, published this work that was done on tin thin films. These were grown on glass by cathode sputtering. Uh, and uh, he um, looked at the and observed the fact that the vanishing point, or the, as we call it today, the critical temperature was suppressed in thin film form. He was also the first to question the role of grain structure of the film in the critical behavior. And this is a very important factor even today in HTS, as we'll see later. He also continued to presage this industry in his explorations of drawn wires. And he did looked at tin wires that were uh, formed and he looked at the suppression of the, of the critical point as the wire was put under tension. And the role of elastic strain is also Im important for Rebco uh, technology today. So he was really much ahead of his time in exploring all of the things which were important to this, this, this technology. Um, I'll take a minute here and stick in a kind of a more modern concept and tie it into the, to the history of superconductors. This is a um, picture uh, graph of what's called the Gartner hype cycle. You may be familiar with this idea, but what it says is that when you have a new technology, it triggers a lot of, uh, of excitement, a lot of exploration into what it might, might be able to do, but often uh, the initial thoughts of what is possible is often a little bit overinflated of what's possible, it leads to uh, disillusionment. And after that, what he calls the trough of disillusionment, there's a lot of research and real work which goes on to understand what are the real capabilities of this te technology as opposed to what we might have naively imagined at the beginning. And eventually it reaches a point where it becomes a productive technology. I think very much this was going on 100 years ago and uh, in what Kamerling Onus Im Im imagined with superconductors. I'm going to pull out some excerpts from one of his one or two of his papers here. Um, he said in the he said first that we notice and my sorry my picture is covering this up but tin and lead are easily workable metals. We can now contemplate all kinds of electrical experiments with apparatus without resistance. So he was already imagining from the science what the technology could, could, could do. In fact, he uh, thought that he could obtain uh, magnetic fields as, in, as intense as one wished to have, that these fields could be without iron cores, uh, magnetic fields on the order of 10 Tesla could be achieved. This is actually a very important kind of order uh, um, uh, scale of number that's in for um, magnetic field technology today using superconductors. Uh, joule heat no more comes into play and current densities of 10 to the third amps per square millimeter, which is also actually a quite relevant number for technology today. So he forced, he, he could foresee all those things and was very excited in that. In fact, he said in his paper, and I'll quote here, as we may trust in an accelerated development of experimental science, this future ought not to be far away. Uh, but then there was this awful footnote he says that an unforeseen difficulty is now found in our way. So what happened? Well, he only knew of what we now identify as type one superconductors. And the superconducting state is destroyed very quickly in the presence of a, a magnetic field. So uh, the future that he hoped would be so not so far away turned out to be further away than, than, he, than he thought. So to give a little bit of, of a timeline here, 
1911 was the discovery of superconductivity. Uh, it took until 1957 for the discovery of type two superconductors, and then 1961 for the discovery of niobium tin, and shortly after that, the first commercial wires which were made from a superconductor. Con it took about 26 more years until eight HGS was discovered and that in thin film form. And I think that that final event there is really the trigger that led to the technology that we're going to see at the end of this, of this talk. So it really took an entire generation to get to um, uh, type two superconductors and then another generation to get to HGS. I want to give a, a, a credit here for a second too to this excellent book by Rogala and Keys. Um, besides the dates that show in this slide, they gave a lot of in interesting information that helped me throughout the preparation of this talk. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, uh, there's a rich history of Nobel Prizes in the um, topic of superconductivity. Um, uh, but we see again, there's that 50 year gap between when it was discovered and when it was, um, and, and when the second uh, Nobel Prize was, prize was awarded. And then another uh, 25 years after that until the Cuprate superconductors earned a Nobel Prize. Uh, so this, uh, uh, again, we see this very long time frame before we get to the point where we're ready to start commercializing something in HTS. And um, this, this, this late 80s is really an important turning point. So just for reference, let me give a small description about type two superconductors. Um, Lev Shubnikov, pictured here on the left, he showed in 1937, that certain alloys remain superconductors even in high fields. Unfortunately, he didn't quite understand what he had uh, and he didn't have a lot of chance to, to promote what he had done because in that same year he was executed by the Soviets. So what he had, what he had learned had to wait uh, until the early 60s for, uh, for it to, to, to finally be understood and, and, and commercialized. Um, on the right, we have a, a picture of a cross section of a billet of a low temperature superconducting um, wire that's in, in manufacturing. So they start out with these very large diameter billets, which are drawn down to very small diameters to make, to make wires. Um, this is not a thin film form of superconductivity. Uh, however, the, this, these low temperature superconductors or LTS are used at very large scale. There's about 5,000 tons of LTS conductor that's made every year. And uh, most of it is going into making superconducting wire. We can see on the left a picture of one of the magnets for the Eater Tokamak. This picture is from uh, last year. And you can tell the size of it based on the, uh, the small people in the middle of, of, of the magnet just before it was shipped. Uh, and on the right, we can see uh, MRI. MRI is a technology which, of course, is very important for medicine now, and which also depends on superconducting magnets. Um, but these must be used at, uh, at or near the uh, temperature of liquid helium, uh, which, of course, is a, is, a lim is a limitation. But on the other hand, this material is very inexpensive. Uh, the performance metric of uh, $2 per kilowatt meter is a typical number. Uh, and what, what that means is the sufficient cross section to carry two kiloamps and a length of one meter. So uh, it's a very low cost material. And we're gonna talk a little more about markets uh, toward the end of this, of this talk. Now, when it comes to superconducting thin films, uh, of LTS, I would say that one of the most, or the most important, single most important technology is probably the Josephson junction. And the Josephson effect was discovered in the early 60s. This is utilized in squid, um, which is an important measurement technology. Uh, and it's also utilized in one, it's one form of qubits for, super, uh, uh, for quantum computers. Um, and these are interesting markets, but uh, squid in terms of thin film devices, uh, you know, from my research, the actual value of the, the squid devices themselves, the, the actual detector element is probably only about, only about $50 million per, 
per year. And, uh, and when you look at a quantum computer, well, Google has at least been able to make the claim of quantum su supremacy with only 53 qubits in the, in, the, in the computer. So it's not exactly a large scale um, coding in industry that might be of interest to the SVC. So the question is, what does make for good business? So I'm going to get a little philosophical here and say that a great opportunity is had when a, uh, um, a, a great um, need that the world has is met by something you can be paid for and that you're really good at doing. The Japanese call this ikai, and uh, I think that it's really interesting to think about what is it that's a good match for what I'm able to do. I think if Carmeling Onus were here today, he'd be thinking something like this. I can make all sorts, I can contemplate all sorts of electrical apparatus if I could apply cooperate thin films to all the things that I had been dreaming of. And I think that for the SVC, this is our purpose. Our purpose is to look for ways to um, uh, advance the technology of thin film for practical appli applications. And as I said earlier, the cooperate super superconductors really opened up a significant opportunity for thin film superconducting devices. And in the second half of this talk is going to focus on how that opportunity got to be what it is um, today. So let's talk a second for about cooperates as HTF. As opposed to the initial discovery of superconductivity, which was accidental, um, the discovery of cooperates really followed a trajectory which was very purposeful. Um, theoreticians were asking what it would take to create a material with better, that is more useful properties uh, in, a, in a superconductor. And uh, um, this work led eventually to the theoretical or the experimental um, proof of higher temperature superconductors with the perovskite structure. Um, and then further work over the next 10 years led to the discovery of the cuprate high TC superconductors, which um, led to a lot of excitement and that major no Nobel Prize, that significant Nobel Prize that, that I mentioned. And uh, finally, YBCO, which is yttrium barium copper oxide, was discovered. It was the first superconductor with a critical temperature above 77 Kelvin. Now, 77 Kelvin, scientifically speaking, is not a, a, a significant number in, in and of itself, but technologically, it's very important because if you can have a superconductor above liquid nitrogen temperature, it becomes much easier and much cheaper to work with. So this really was a uh, uh, very exciting technologically speaking as well as scientifically speaking. And then in that same year, YBCO was grown by thin films uh, methods using actually pulse laser de deposition. And, uh, and this really opened up a gigantic technological landscape for thin film superconductors. It was quite exciting. This was actually referred to the American Physical Society meeting in 1987 was actually referred to as the Woodstock of physics. Uh, my, my professor actually had attended that, um, that session and he really communicated about the excitement. You can tell how excited these physicists are in the room because they're actually talking to, to one another. Um, and there was about 2,000 people in this session and it lasted in through the middle of, of, of the night. And uh, it was, this is really a once in a career event to think about a uh, discovery generating this much excitement um, amongst, among scientists. Matter of fact, it, the excitement was so great that it spilled over into the popular culture. Um, this is a cartoon from the United States in uh, June 1987. And this shows a, a boy genius over here who had, dis, who had uh, constructed a levitation device based on high temperature superconductors. And it just thought that, that was hilarious. It, it captured the public's Im imagination to, 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 to that extent. So why is 2G HTS so exciting? Now I'm gonna to refer to this as 2G because it's the, the REBCO form is, is considered second generation as opposed to the earlier BISCO, which I won't, which I won't be talking to, uh, about today. But why is this so exciting? Here's some data from the University of, Americans, uh, of, of Maryland, Stephen Onlodge. And this shows the 
boundary between the superconducting state and the normal state in, uh, in, in, in materials. And you can see the envelope for the LTS over here is quite, quite small, quite close to the origin in this temperature, current density, magnetic field space. But uh, for the superconductors, we see for the high temperature superconductors based on Rebco, we see that the normal state extends to much higher temperatures, which makes it a lot so much easier to use. But the thing which is really most interesting in which Dr. Onus would have had, had despaired of obtaining but wanted to obtain is over here on the right. The high current density is maintained in the superconductor even into the presence of very large magnetic fields. And that's what's really significant in this technology and the ability to create um, large magnetic fields and other applications as we'll talk about. So those early uh, great article, very exuberant article in 1989 in the Scientific American, I actually referred to it as rational exuberance because uh, as we'll see, he imagined a lot of applications. The author here, Wolski, imagined quite a lot of applications that um, could arise from HTS technology. Uh, and the question is, well, how many of these, which were postulated in 1989, are still in play today? And the answer is most of it. Um, he talked about how, how MRI could be advanced with, with this. And indeed, it's the MRI is uh, starting to look into the incorporation of HTS elements into, the, into the, uh, their technology. And this is a, a reference from 2019. Generators. Um, this is a this is a project. Echo Swing is a project that is in using HTS for a wind generator. So the, the the turbine generator is based on HTS only. Motors, uh, which can be smaller and lighter. This is an example from 2019 of a ship motor, but also the, you'll see airplane uh, engines uh, motor being replaced by superconducting motors, which we'll touch on later. Uh, power distribution, so um, e e electrical lines and devices such as fault current limiters, such as this article, which was published by SuperOx in 2020. Uh, bullet trains, and we'll, we'll see an example of that later, um, which is very relevant today. And magnetic energy storage, SMED, energy storage SMEDs. All of these things are still being researched and also put into application to, 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 to today. Um, the author did say at the, in the article, it's going to require sustained effort for at least a decade. He was a little bit off on that. It's been three decades now and the sustained effort is still being uh, put, into, put into place to make this happen, but it, but it, it, it is happening. We're gonna talk a little more about that as we go along. So why is this so challenging? Um, well, Rebco is a ceramic, and because it's a ceramic oxide, the bulk material is stiff and brittle, and this is limiting in the applications. You can see this coil that someone fastened, which is from the Scientific American article as well. Um, it's very difficult to make anything that's useful in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in this kind of a, of a form. So utilizing it in a thin film form is very important to be able to take advantage of this technology. In fact, I'm going to read this quote from the Scientific American article as well. Um, he said, some people are considering whether thin films can be attached to a backing material and wound like a roll of paper towels to make a conductor capable of carrying large currents. So he really nailed it with, an with that. So I can't help you with that. Sorry, my phone. <laughs> um, uh, and so he really foresaw exactly what the industry started doing. Um, it's very exciting. This is a great thin film challenge that we find in, in, in Rebco. Um, and there's, a, there's several reasons why there are challenges and why it's a complicated thin film system. There's a lot of conditions that have to be met. The film uh, Rebco material is very sensitive to grain structure. You can see this SEM picture of, a, of grain structure in, in YBCO. Uh, and these grain boundaries really frustrate the superconducting state. So the films have to be epitaxial. They're very sensitive to contaminants, so that they must be protected. The, the chemical stability is a factor because the oxygen tends to diffuse out of the, the material over time. That must be stopped. 
the type two behavior, and we're not going to talk too much about, we're not going to talk about flux pinning here, but the type two behavior has to be optimized. It needs to be given a good mechanical strength and flatness. So this really creates a rich playground for thin film deposition. Um, so uh, our, through, our manufacturing has to be very exacting, but also has to be high throughput. So let's look at one example. This is a typical film stack up from Superox. Um, and this is uh, from a paper they published, uh, actually it just, was just published in scientific reports this year. Um, and uh, we'll see there's multiple layers in here. Every layer has a function. So let's walk very quickly through this. Start with a um, uh, substrate, which is a, an alloy tape. And the tape provides mechanical strength and flatness. Uh, we have an in-diffusion barrier to keep those metal ions out of the, out of the film. There's a nucleation layer, which is uh, typically a Y203. Uh, and the Y203 nucleation helps with the formation of the epitaxial seed, which is made from MGO. This is actually a, a bilayer film. The first uh, 10 nanometers or so is put down with IBAD. And then the second portion of the film is done with a, a high temperature homo epitaxial growth. Uh, of MGO. Then there's a, a lattice matching layer, which could be lanthanum mang manganate or cerium oxide, such as that. Then the Rebco layer can be put down. There's a variety of methods which are used for depositing this layer. Not all of them are vacuum coated, but several are PLD and evaporation, MOCVD, but there's also liquid based methods that can, that can be used for this. Then there's a silver layer, which is an out diffusion barrier to, to trap the oxygen in the film. It also provides a current shunt. And then there's finally a, a second current shunt layer, which is thicker and deposited by, by copper, uh, in copper by electroplating. So there's a lot of varieties of this formulation. Each manufacturer does it somewhat differently. I think the fact that there's a uh, lack of a solid theoretical underpinning means that the empiricists are in charge. You know, the empirical formulation from vendor to, to vendor uh, really leads each one optimizing something slightly different. So let's talk about the, the commercial aspects of this. Um, in 2010, American Superconductor um, sell, uh, got a contract to sell 3 million meters of 2G HGS to LS cable in in, in South Korea. So now we're talking about a serious consideration about moving just beyond magnets. You know, magnets for accelerators or MRI, they're measurement devices. And we're really talking about moving beyond just scientific measurement devices. Um, and so obviously that was very exciting at the time. Um, it's hard to find out exactly what happened with this contract. It appears to have died uh, based on media reports of projects which were going to be using this wire, those projects were, 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 were canceled. Uh, so what this, what this says is that how, whatever happened, this is evidence of insufficient market pull for, these, uh, for this te technology. Although it could do it, the market didn't seem to be ready for it. Um, uh, nevertheless, there are several ma manufacturers uh, who have production lines. This is just an example. This is an M MOC CVD machine from Superpower. And this is a buffer layer line from Shang um, Shanghai Superconducting Technologies. Typically, they have a module for each layer, and the tape reel is moved from machine, from, from machine to, to, to machine during the production process. Uh, a majority of this tape goes into magnet construction for science and measurement. Um, and although, the, as I've mentioned, there's prototype devices for a lot of different things being, uh, being made. PVD products obviously was, is in this market. And we made a quite a number of production tools um, be, before 2014. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we made both buffer layer and Rebco layer deposition tools. Uh, we sold uh, quite a number of them. And um, uh, at the point around 2014, those, those uh, machine orders and the advancement of this technology kind of dried up and stagnated. So the question is, what, what happened? Um, I really interpret this as 
in the, using the concept of a technology push versus a market pull. The Segway is a great example of a technology push. Think about what this amazing technology is gonna be able to do. Uh, in reality, it struggled. And uh, uh, the technology push alone wasn't enough to make it succeed. But think about a market pull. The cell phone camera is a great example. Consumers love that technology and they push the cell phone manufacturers to ever improve uh, and give more and more options to those cell phone cameras. So I think that the HTS dreamers of what the technology could do and the people who were buying it were not in alignment the way that they could have been. They weren't the same group. I think forces like green energy weren't as powerful as they are to, to today. And the maturity of the technology, the production uh, capability, and also the cost of it weren't yet what the market wanted. Now, there are several um, participants today. Here's the major ones here um, all around the, the, the world who, who are making this uh, product. Um, the world output is somewhere around 5,000 to 10,000 um, kilometers at four millimeter width equivalent. And the technology uh, uh, still has this large production gap. There's the, the forces that could spur it to grow further haven't quite ripened yet. And I think when you consider the market size in the next slide, we'll get some more idea about that. And the low output also keeps the prices high. We're still at about 100 to 300 kiloamp per, per meter for this material, uh, kilo per kiloamp meter for this, this material. Uh, let's have a little look at, at market uh, in, in pro projection. So where is this going in the, in the future? talked about the current state, where is it going? This data was kindly provided to me by BCC Research, and it talks about various markets for high temperature superconductors. Con uh, the biggest market, as you can see, is magnets, and most of these magnets are going into particle accelerators and, um, and into um, uh, magnets for scientific research and, and, de and detectors. Um, so that's a six, seven billion dollar market. But it's really, it's really dominated by LTS and LTS works just fine for a lot of these. And HGS would always struggle, I, th I think, to capture a lot of this market share. Uh, um, but if you look at the next line, we're talking about electrical equipment. These are things such as motors, Gen generators, um, you, you, utility lines, uh, all of these, all of these things that have to do with um, uh, 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 other uses for magnets. Um, these are very, it's a very small market for superconductors today, but they're very rapidly growing. You can see these, uh, these caggers that they give around 40 to 50% for these, these, these materials. So, um, there's a lot of excitement there. So what are these markets that are, that are pulling for HTS? Um, now these are, these are market sizes, not for superconductors, but for some, but the market size is for technologies that are familiar to all of us. Electricity consumption, uh, greater than a trillion dollars per, 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 per year. Um, aircraft, trains, power gen generation, power transmission. These are all things which are core to the needs of, of, of society. They touch everyone. And so these are applications where the numbers become way more significant. And when the market is worth more than Jeff Bezos, that's a, that's a good in, in indicator of the market value. Um, so HTS, besides being useful in these markets, has a strong advantage. There's a lot of places where LTS is not practical or is impossible to be, to, 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 to be used. So uh, the manufacturing um, has to, uh, capability has to grow though to serve those markets. We need to get the price of this material down to below about 10 kiloamp, uh, $10 per kiloamp meter. So as we, as we come into a close, I'm just gonna mention a couple of applications. One is electricity generation. Fusion, as you can see from these investment numbers under here, there's one Commonwealth Fusion in the US and Tokamak Energy in the UK are drawing in a lot of funding. And these technologies are critically need HTS. We can estimate from the electricity use in the world that a moderate size 
compact fusion reactor from one of these companies would require about 20,000 kilometers of tape and it's probably about $60 million worth and 125 to 150 of these reactors would be required to meet just 1% of the world electricity need. So there's a huge possibility for what could be done with this, this te technology, but it needs uh, lower price tape. It needs a lot more of it. Power transmission is another example. Projects which were canceled in the past are now actually being funded by municipalities to put this into practice. And these um, uh, green energy solutions are extremely important and relevant to, to society now. And HTS can, can serve those and is serving those. Transportation is another example. We see a 50 megawatt electric, electric motor on the left and a, and a um, high TC um, maglev train on, on, on the right. This all, these are projects which are pulling HTS in. They demand HTS to be able to, to do what they need to, to do. So to come into a close, I think we're really at an inflection point now. We're 110 years after um, the discovery of superconductivity, 60 years after it was first com commercialized, 34 years after the discovery of, of Rebco. And now today we see significant investment into applications that are incorporating HTS, not just the HTS itself. And that market pull, I think, is the inflection point of this technology. So there's really the need for the technologies with expertise and large scale manufacturing within film technologies to help bring it forward. And I think the SVC is that group. And uh, I hope this encourages you to consider how you might participate in the future of this technology. Thank you for listening.